By 1992, 3D shooter video games from a first-person perspective were nothing new. All the way back in 1974, two games called Maze War and Spaceum created the genre. Over the years, commercially sold products like Battlezone and Wing Commander emerged that brought the genre forward. These games were from big-name developers and publishers like Atari and Origin. But on May 5th of 92, a game released that would blow them all away, reinventing the genre on the spot. It didn't come from a big-name developer. It came from a couple of kids making video games in their apartment and calling themselves id Software. It didn't sit on store shelves in nicely made boxes. Rather, a portion of it was downloaded by kids with modems for free, and then the rest would be mailed to the gamer directly if he paid a fee. It was Wolfenstein 3D, and it was a revelation. Slicker, faster, and prettier than anything else on the market, Wolfenstein showcased both the design prowess of John Romero and the engineering genius of John Carmack. The combination of non-stop action and visual feast was unbeatable. The game was a towering success, and id immediately wanted to move on to the next project. They didn't exactly know what it would be yet, but thanks to a line from Tom Cruise in The Color of Money, they already knew that the name would be Doom. Just before the release of Wolfenstein, the id crew decided it was high time to move again. They'd just survived their first winter in Wisconsin, barely. Meanwhile, Scott Miller over at their publisher Apogee was encouraging the guys to move closer to him in Dallas, Texas. Since Texas also happened to be much closer to the sun, id and the guys moved to Mesquita on April 1st, 1992. After the Texas move, id wanted to make a follow-up to their smash success in Wolfenstein, and also a brand new game showcasing the brand new engine that Carmack was hard at work building. They still only had a handful of people, and they all wanted to be working on the new game with the new engine. They decided to hand Wolfenstein 2 off to Apogee, which also had an internal development team. Apogee put a lot of great work into the project, but id would later backtrack on their own idea and cancel the project. Rather than let it all go to waste, Apogee retooled the game and released it as an original IP called Rise of the Triad. As for the id crew, the first thing they needed to do was settle on an idea. Wolfenstein had been a blast because of its action and visuals, but also because of its cool pulp Nazi theme. They needed something equally cool, but totally different and fresh. They actually tossed around the idea of doing a game based on the 1986 film Aliens, but they knew they'd have to relinquish creative control to 20th Century Fox. Rather than argue with a movie studio, why not do their own thing? Carmack offered demons as a cool subject. Most of the guys had played a long-running Dungeons & Dragons campaign together in which demons had figured prominently. They'd enjoyed fighting demons then, and the guys agreed the gamers probably would too. Better, what if they combine the awesome sci-fi tech from the Aliens movie with demonic monsters from hell? That could be a killer combination. The id crew loved the idea. Adrian Carmack, the young artist who had found an id, along with the other Carmack, Romero, and Tom Hall, was ecstatic. He loved drawing the sick and twisted, but so far id had only done kitty games like Commander Keen or realistic games like Wolfenstein a demonic game would let him finally go wild. The one guy who wasn't happy was Hall. Hall had been the mastermind behind Keen, which matched his preference for lighthearted games. Wolfenstein had been too brutal and bloody for his tastes. He'd been expecting id to go back to making Keen after the Nazi affair, but to his horror found that instead id would be ratcheting up the mature content to the next level. As the guys got to work designing their new experience, Carmack was, yet again, crafting a groundbreaking masterpiece in his new engine. Still just 21 years old, Carmack wanted the new Doom engine to make the Wolfenstein tech look primitive. Instead of having one flat surface, he wanted to have multi-leveled rooms and stairways. Instead of being trapped indoors all day, he wanted to go out into open spaces. He wanted to have dynamic lighting. He wanted to have odd angles and weird geometry and he wanted it all to run smoothly on the hardware an average gamer might have. In short, he once again wanted to do the impossible. 
And while Doom would represent a leap forward for engine technology, it would also be a leap for its business. Apogee distributed a portion of their games as free shareware online, and then mailed the full game as physical discs to gamers who paid a fee. Under a very generous contract, a large portion of the revenue was split with id. While immensely profitable, Apogee was now falling victim to its own success. Orders for the full version of the game were processed over the phone by one or two guys. That worked fine when Apogee was small. Now Wolfenstein had made them huge, but it was still one or two guys hand processing every order. Id wanted them to contract with a phone order processing company, but Miller was slow to change. By now, the Id crew had seen everything they'd needed to. They were intimately familiar with the shareware distribution model, which required no overhead and no investment. It was time for them to implement it themselves. They could go fully independent, self-distribute their own game, and keep all the revenue for themselves. The guys were ready to strike out on their own. For the game itself, they pulled out all the stops. Romero crafted levels that not only perfectly showcased Carmack's tech, but also took the Wolfenstein formula to the next dimension. Adrian Carmack and new artist Kevin Cloud went for that extra layer of realism by crafting their monsters out of clay with the help of professional modeler Gregor Punchetz. The results were then scanned into the computer for a look that no other game could match. Adrian Carmack could finally unleash his taste for the bizarre, and his enthusiasm shined through his work. But for all that, the good spirits weren't contagious. Tom Hall was still not happy on the project. He would never like the violent direction, but he had at least tried to come up with a compelling character and story. But Romero and the others rejected his narrative, stating that it would only get in the way of a pure action experience. Doom only needed to establish a cool setting. Any actual dialogue or characterization would just water down the result. With no passion for the project, Hall's work output suffered. Tom Hall had founded id with the other guys. He had been the very first to realize the potential of Carmack's side-scrolling engine, and he had helped make Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement. Commander Keen, id's first success, had been his idea. But the company was no longer the same. It had grown up without him, and now it had outgrown him. Based on his lackluster output for Doom, he was asked to leave the company. He was stunned. But after some hesitation, he realized that it was the best thing for everybody. If Id was going to make games like Doom, then it was time for him to get going. Not for the last time, one of the founding voices of Id Software quit out. As the game neared completion, they sent out early builds of the game to playtesters. Not long afterwards, an alpha version of the game leaked onto the internet. It wasn't exactly a good thing, since these gamers' first impression would be of an unfinished code. But it did help to drive the game's hype to a fever pitch. It was already an underground phenomenon, since legions of Wolfenstein fans couldn't wait for id's next project. Now it was on everyone's mind. Even the leaked alpha game was amazing. The finished version would have to be a masterpiece. At last, on December 10th, 1993, id uploaded the free trial version of the game onto a server at the University of Wisconsin. As soon as it went up, the server crashed. It had been overloaded with download requests. It was midnight. The University of Wisconsin had never seen, never fathomed that kind of traffic before, and certainly not in the middle of the night. Doom had arrived. Wolfenstein had put the rest of the gaming world to shame. Doom had made it look like a kid's toy. Only one year younger, Carmack's Doom engine looked a generation beyond the Wolfenstein tech. Filling out the engine's power was the outrageous art design of Adrian Carmack and Kevin Cloud. Romero's level designs and enemy encounters were a masterclass in pacing, tension, and unrestrained adrenaline. It was everything that Wolfenstein had been, but it was better. And there was one other, minor, little addition. 
multiplayer. Up to four players could play on a local network, or two players could go head-to-head -head over the internet. Romero had coined this game style as Deathmatch. It became an industry buzzword, as the multiplayer component soon overtook the campaign as the biggest reason to buy the game. Commercially, critically, and historically, the impact of Doom cannot be overstated. Wolfenstein had been a mammoth, runaway hit by selling roughly 200,000 copies. By 1995, it was estimated that Doom was on 10 million computers. The exact number is hard to track since the game had a free downloadable component, but any way you slice it, that is an absolute win. Bill Gates himself was jealous as his company Microsoft had just spent millions of dollars advertising Windows 95 in return for less traction than a couple of guys in Mesquita, Texas got off of reputation alone. The result was a Windows 95 event showcasing the operating system as a games platform, which included a video with Gates himself in Doom's world. These games are getting really realistic. Next year I might even play in the uh, big Doom tournament. You might wonder what I'm doing here. The richest man on earth put himself in a video game to help sell the biggest product of the biggest tech company in history. That was Doom. And if all that wasn't enough, Carmack had also specifically made Doom to be modder friendly. Modders were programmers who would take a game and change or modify the code to do something else. This was normally a fairly difficult hack. Doom made it easy and accessible, allowing all kinds of coders to show off their creativity in any number of ways. It was just one more reason to buy the game. In fact, it was a value addition even for non-coders, since they could still benefit from all the new levels and modes being unleashed by the modder community. It was like buying one game and then getting tons of new content for free every week. It wasn't a product, it was a service. And of course, half the industry wanted to license Carmack's tech. For a fee, they could. The end result was a roar of money the likes of which had rarely been seen. To give some perspective, a modern game with a multi-million dollar advertising campaign across all gaming platforms is considered a success if it sells several million units. Doom did that just by word of mouth at a time when the gaming market was much smaller at a time when the internet was only in its nascent stages. Doom is frequently cited as the most influential and important video game in the history of the medium. For years after its release, other first-person shooters, and there were a lot of them afterwards, were referred to as Doom clones. It's been called the most ported game of all time. The id crew weren't rock stars anymore. They were legends and millionaires to boot. Romero and Carmack became famous for their sweet Ferraris. Carmack, being the perfectionist he was, even dared to mod the supercar into even better performance. But Carmack could always be counted on to keep a level head. Romero went off the rails, fully embracing his new superstar status to live it up with parties, cars, and his own custom-built mansion. His lifestyle wouldn't be a problem, so long as he kept up his work ethic. Romero was sure that he would. The other guys were not. Tune in next time to see Id split apart. <laughs>